Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. My name is Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Dr. Stephen Bailey, a naturopathic physician for over 30 years in general family practice, as well as a nationally recognized authority in therapeutic fasting and juicing. He was also ordained as a reverend and a pastor of gospel ministry at Celebration Tabernacle Church in Portland and directs their nonprofit health program. Dr. Bailey was an assistant professor at the National College of Naturopathic Medicine and is a sought-after lecturer at naturopathic colleges and conferences. He has been a strong activist and advocate for natural medicine and served as Speaker of the House of Delegates for the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. He is the author of The Fasting Diet and co-author of Juice Alive and has contributed to numerous natural health books and articles, including the classic Alternative Medicine by Burton Goldberg. Now, today we're going to discuss his brand new book, The Reluctant Healer, The Life and Times of Dr. Ralph Weiss, who was Edgar Cayce's physician and an extraordinary pioneer. Dr. Weiss is now in his 90s and still lives in Oregon. So welcome, Stephen. I am so looking forward to this. Thank you, Miriam. It's so nice to be on your show. Thank you. Now, Ralph Weiss was both your mentor and your friend. Tell us about him and why you wrote the book. Well, um, Ralph is an extraordinarily humble and quiet man who I knew of and knew for about 20 years in the profession. He actually signed my license, um, to practice back in 1983, so his name is up on my wall. He served on our board, and basically I just had a um, long-distance admiration for him as he was down in Midford, uh, not that far, but six hours from Portland, and we crossed paths very rarely. And then one day, about eight and a half years ago, I joined a line for a convention right behind Ralph. He turned around and smiled, and his beautiful eyes just glistening with his long white hair. And, Stephen, it's been so long. And Ralph and I chatted for a little while and agreed that the first lecture we wanted to attend was the same conference. And we sat together and basically had so much shared interest and experience that for the three days of that conference, we set together every single class. And about a year later, one of my dearest friends in the profession, now deceased, Bill Mitchell, who was one of the founders of Bastyr University, another friend, John Bastyr, who is a contemporary of Ralph that passed away 15 years ago, um... And Bill found out that Ralph had taken me under his wing as his student, and Bill said, you have got to get Ralph out to the young doctors in this field because when we were tiny, we had all of the elder leaders there teaching us, and Ralph is the last pioneer left in our profession that shows the courage that people stood up as the money and politics of medicine and pharmaceuticals look to remove the option of natural choices throughout the 20th century. So Bill gave me this assignment, and uh, Ralph and I had been developing a deep friendship, and it continued to deepen. And Ralph and I spoke in front of conventions in Washington and Oregon and Arizona, and I got him out to the students. And then my publisher found out... um, shortly after I found out, because Ralph had never talked much about himself, that he treated Edgar Cayce from 1939 to 1943. And that put a seed into my publisher's um, fertile ideas (laughs) of, we really need to get this story out to the public. And Rudy, my publisher, he helped get Bernard Jensen's works out in a better level, He was the publisher of Enzyme Nutrition with the late, great Dr. Howell, who discovered the first enzymes and pioneered the use of enzymes in medicine. 
And so I had a very dedicated publisher who basically sat with me for seven and a half years to take this monumental story down to a very nice read. And, uh, and I sit with a huge amount of information yet to share. But the story of The Reluctant Healer is inspirational. And it speaks of a man whose greatness is through his humility and his good works, not through his fame, fortune, wealth, or power. He really has a, a fascinating story. Um, he started actually in, in some kind of sports medicine. Am I correct? Started in some kind of what medicine? Sports. Sports. sports medicine. Well, that was his fourth doctorate. Um, <laughs> Ralph got seven doctorates during the time from 1936 to 1949. And <clears throat> the fourth doctorate was a doctorate in a word that your listeners probably have never heard, physiocolposcopy. And this was a degree offered by Bernard McFadden, who was a multimillionaire fitness guru of the 19th and 20th century. In fact, in 1899, McFadden opened the first 19 gymnasiums and weight rooms in America. He owned a publishing company, so he was a millionaire with true detectives, true lives, all sorts of magazines that we grew up in the 50s reading. And he taught weightlifting and fitness and nutrition, and he had a school. And so Ralph was always into fitness, growing up in a coal, copper town, mining town, doing hard work on the farm, taking martial arts. And that was one of his. But the first thing was the story that, that you read as you read the book, Marion, about the fact that when Ralph was 12, he had... A severe pain in his stomach, started vomiting blood. His dad took him to the local church in Amic, Michigan, where on Saturdays the mine doctor would, the doctor for the town copper mine would come in and do his visits. That was the, the health plan was on Saturdays you could come and if needed the doctor would come home. The doctor said he had nothing to offer Ralph. You know, this was a very simple and primitive time, and he really had no options from his standards in this small town. And Ralph had been given a book, a magazine called Nature's Path, that was a magazine out of American College of Naturopathic Medicine in New York by Benedict Lust, who was the founder of Naturopathic Medicine credited in America. And it was on prayer and fasting. And so Ralph chose at age of 12 to defy his parents and do a 31-day water fast, which completely healed his bleeding stomach ulcer and led him into a passionate embracing of natural medicine and prayer and religion. So when Ralph got out of Amic and out of Calumet in high school and went to Detroit, he got a sacred theology doctorate from Wayne College, an engineering certification, and then headed off, barely in his early 20s, to New York City to get a naturopathic doctorate with Benedict Lust, who shared the colleges and sanitariums with Frederick Collins. So Ralph spent two years in New York, New Jersey, and Florida, and got two doctorates in naturopathic medicine. And then he extended the work in Michigan with Bernard McFadden and got the doctorate in physiocoposcopy. So Ralph has always been into fitness. He was a vegetarian at that point in his life, but his wife seemed to do better with a little fish and occasional meat. So he strayed from the roots of naturopathic medicine, which was totally plant-based. Um, but in his mid-90s now is an example of what you can accomplish if you obey the natural laws of good nutrition, good meditation, good prayer, good lifestyle, and good works. Mm. It's a, a fascinating interweaving of 
the um, the spiritual, the natural, um, both both you and um, and Ralph are. I would, you know, pretty religious, I guess you would call it, or, or spiritual. Um, tell me how this spirituality informs both your and, and perhaps both Ralph's um, practice. Yeah. Well, um, I would say that Ralph and I are both not religious because we both think that Organized religion generally moves out of out of the creed and the service and the truth behind the beatitudes that we hold so important in our form. But both Ralph and I have a respect for the sacred beliefs of of the world's religion. So while we are both ordained within Christian um, educations, we are both respectful and broad in believing that all is one. Ralph had a number of what we would call psychic experiences throughout his youth, things that confirmed doors that are opened outside of the straight physical world. Ralph started dousing with his father to find the subtle templates that led us to water, but became enthused with very many different ways that the Spirit speaks through various mediums. So Ralph and a famous man, Max Freedom Long, wrote a book on pendulums in the 50s, but Ralph chose to be anonymous and Freedom Long chose a pen name. But Ralph would apply Christian and Eastern energetics to when the pendulum energy is clear and unbiased, and Ralph would and always has put a great amount of prayer and intention in every day of his life. So when Ralph and I agreed to write this book, it wasn't an agreement to write a book about Ralph, and I know he would never have agreed to this book eight years ago because he wanted us to share our beliefs in the seven bodies of man, the ancient mysteries, philosophy, and practice of natural medicine. But he is such an esteemed elder that... that I dropped totally out of the book and chose to to represent Ralph. So he's given me a lot of guides on how to practice, and and I am constantly in prayer and meditation to be of service and safe with my patients. So I believe that there's a thread of light. Um, I I teach philosophy, and I may be teaching history and philosophy again this year at the college. And the Neoplatonists spoke of God being light and fire. The God being the light is is the grace that comes when we accept the abundance of what follows natural law. The fire or the wrath is not an intentional action. It's what ha- is what happens as a consequence of our following our physical wants and desires versus staying true to the natural laws and needs of our purpose. So I think Ralph and I both do our best, recognizing we are nowhere close to perfect, to try to seek humility, try to be of service to people, and try to be clear to understand what our callings are. Mm. How did Ralph meet Edgar Cayce? Uh, when Ralph went back to Michigan after American College, Michigan did not have a naturopathic practice act, although Ralph, under drugless acts, got certified to practice drugless medicine in 23 different states, which meant 23 different examinations. But in Michigan, he chose to join the practice of an osteopathic doctor who admired and respected him. And the osteopathic doctor had a chiropractor who would occasionally come in and train or do some work. And the chiropractor had visited Edgar Casey, and and Casey was starting to be discussed in Reader's Digest and Life Magazine and other national prints more than the little insular discussions that happened when he first revealed his gifts. And Ralph called to see if he and Dr. Eels could come and get what was called a life reading. Casey did a lot of different 
types of spiritual sharing with people. The most noted is the 15,000 names and addresses that he was given that under a trance he accurately diagnosed their health problems and the appropriate restorative cures. And these 15,000 people, most of them had had dead-end results with many specialists and doctors and I believe only twice out of over 15,000 was there not a outcome consistent with what Casey said would happen if the people followed the program. The other thing Casey did, um, Casey was also a Christian school teacher, so there's, there's a lot of parallels. The fact that I've done water fasts equal to or longer than Ralph's has had him in connection with me since my first book on fasting. And fasting is an area that opens up a greater awareness of the spirit. So as you open your eyes to see, uh, both he and I think the truth reveals itself as gifts that are there for us to utilize and being of greatest strength in the work that we do. So Dr. Eels and Ralph drive down to Virginia Beach, taking a nice picnic lunch and all excited, and Dr. Eels really wanted a life reading, which was uh, talking about your purpose, but also something that took Casey years to accept and took Ralph some time to accept, which is the theory of reincarnation. And so um, when Dr. Eels and Dr. Weiss, Ralph, showed up, they came to Casey's house, not the Institute, on that day, greeted at the door by Casey's wife, and Casey chose not to respond to Dr. Eels' request, but to pull Ralph aside and to do a life reading on him. And Casey revealed that Ralph had had 57 previous lives and never a life of violence, and that he'd never never seen that type of a, of a track record in other <laughs> incarnations. And um, he became enamored with, with Ralph and recognized that Ralph, more than the osteopath, more than the chiropractors that he'd seen, had a true gift of healing touch. Not only very well advanced manipulative and adjustment techniques, but just really energy that came forth from his being that transmitted an energy back to Casey. And so they would talk on the phone, and every once in a while, and Ralph would generally know that if Casey was going to call him up in Detroit, that Casey was exhausted and needed him, but was so much of a humble servant that it would be hard for Casey to ask him to come down. But over the next four years, Ralph would go down, generally fly to an adjoining airport and go to Virginia Beach and spend time and counsel. And, you know, Ralph has a cute term. He said that he talks about people like um, Edgar Casey as not having good people skills. <laughs> and so, you know, Casey was not somebody who could go schmooze and... and be good in a social environment and had a lot of people who had tried to take advantage of him. So Ralph served, I think, as much a, a source of true friendship as a healer. And as people who have followed Edgar Casey know his life story, from 1938 through 1940, Casey was starting to get wakeful premonitions of the future of his local towns children in a war which was yet to include the United States and he started becoming a high desired freak or entity or spiritual guide for thousands upon thousands of people around the United States as we entered the war and Casey who had been advised by his spirit guide to never do more than two or three readings a day maybe an hour and a half because of the energy it took, ended up by the time Ralph moved out of relationship doing 22 hours a day of readings. And he just basically burned, <clears throat> burned his life force out as he chose to sacrifice himself to bring comfort and awareness to the thousands of people that were asking for his, his wisdom. Wow. 
Wow. Now, the, there there are a number of themes um, within the book. One is, of course, the story of Ralph Weiss, but uh, the other is the story of the the history, really, of naturopathy and its struggles to find um, a place within the world that was being overtaken by the governmental organizations like the FDA. Um, you were a political activist on behalf of naturopathy from a very young age, were you not? Yeah, I, I uh, left as a program director for a program for adult disabled to go into naturopathic studies in the late 70s but I've been very active in a number of social roles in the state and had a relationship with a lot of our legislators outside of naturopathic medicine. So I was sort of a found commodity as soon as, as a young student I entered. The administration realized that I had a lot of valuable contacts, and so it was... Uh, leather to the sidewalk right away for me and um, I was more than happy but before I was done with our four years of school um, as a result of Ralph actually and I didn't know this at the time um, he had actually as, as medicine was trying to take the descriptive versus literal scientific term drugless medicine which was in our practice act, meaning that we could not use anything that had any therapeutic benefit. <laughs> Ralph decided that he would apply for a federal drug license because he had the training, education, and capability. And the FDA told him to pull back his application three times. And um, finally, he, with the support of our attorney general, arranged a meeting. And at the last moment, they backed down and awarded him the first drug license for a nature path and since he'd done this within the proper order of the Oregon government and had contacted the state attorney general with the pharmacy board and the medical associations before applying the state was silent for two years but when I got to my last year of, of medical school the pharmacy board had introduced through some of my best friends from the Liberal Democratic Party of Oregon a law to ban us from having any prescriptive rights. And so I cleared one day a week um, from my last two terms of school and went to Salem every Thursday and walked the halls trying to get people. And finally, through a lot of work by our profession, the bill didn't make it out of committee. but. Um, that was the type of arbitrary outside redefinition that was assaulting natural medicine and drugless medicine and sanipractic and drugless medicines with various names throughout the country that had been basically meeting the traditional and cultural needs of the communities. We call it naturopathic medicine, and it has a clear definition and a U.S. Um, official definition. But naturopathic medicine is basically an American extension of traditional medicine of the highest level. And so this has been, in contrast to the orthodoxy and the power of medical establishments, and so Ralph experienced the time being on our board for five governors. I spent time in the basement of our Salem archives. and found that almost every year some medical organization had introduced a bill to remove part of the existing practice rights of naturopaths. Can't treat people with cancer, can't draw blood, can't do x-rays. We've been in practice for a hundred years, but with this new assault um, and with no track record of, of endangerment to the public, we were on a constant defensive in Salem. So, yeah, it, it is hard to be awake, to become a member of a traditional community, and to not have to be political. Hmm. Do you think that it was more a turf war, or was it 
kind of uh, an economic rearguard action by the pharmaceutical industry or a combination of the above? Hmm. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. The friend of my enemy is my enemy. I don't know how you go. It's a whole cluster of people. <clears throat> Very clearly in the 30s, the editor of, of the American Medical Association's um, magazine and head of the AMA um, did a 20-year campaign against medicine. So the AMA had a forefront of intentional obstruction, and it even included into uh, the late 70s with a federal ruling for the AMA to cease and desist from misrepresentation and obstruction of chiropractic medicine. So there was that. The FDA, um, that's an interesting entity because... Um, its creation came out of the Pure Food and Drug Act that was passed in, I believe, 1901 to 1903 with Dr. Wiley being the pioneer. But two years after the start of the Pure Food and Drug Act oversight, um, Teddy Roosevelt was taking an angina drug by a Georgia corn company called Saccharin, which was just corn syrup. And Dr. Wiley called it quackery. And that upset the ego of our good friend Teddy Roosevelt, and so he appointed a Dr. Ramos as the new head of the Bureau of Chemistry. And that corn syrup company is who evolved into Monsanto, as I understand the history. So when we talk about Monsanto having a voice in the FDA, <laughs> as well as other pharmaceutical industries, it didn't take 100 years, it didn't take 50, it only took two years for the good intention of proper oversight of food and drugs to be co-opted. But this is what led the combination of food and drug lobby interests to define a drug as an agent of therapeutic action and a food as a nutrient with no therapeutic action. So in the book we talk about Ralph's friend, Royal Lee, who was arrested 78 times by the FDA for making appropriate well-documented scientific claims of physical benefits from chemicals found within foods. Mm -hmm. We well, believe beat the government 78 times, but it was only because he was a multimillionaire as a, as a dentist um, that he was able to withstand the assault by the powers. Many people did become roadkill in this assault, and there was a tremendous amount of of controversy throughout the 20th century between the dominant conventional medicine and the many branches of, of medicine that had a more humanistic and a more spiritual and natural base. And of course, it certainly hasn't stopped in the 21st century. No, no, it's, it's you know, from my standpoint, there's a, a sort of movement right now for conventional medicine to with a very soft breath admit some of the truth of the other forms of medicine and absorb them versus develop a relationship of respect and cross-reference so <laughs> if you can't beat them join of, yeah if you can't beat them join them so well I in this case if you can't beat them by them yeah yeah, yeah absolutely hmm I, I was listening to, um, it was the Charlie Rose Show, and he had a panel of neuroscientists, uh, including a Nobel laureate, talking about research in brain neurochemistry and brain electrical potentials. Yeah. And there was one sentence that the Nobel laureate let loose and nobody followed up on, that so intrigued me. He said that they had discovered um, real changes in brain physiology from uh, cognitive behavioral intervention. Mm -hmm. What he's actually saying is what you think actually produces chains, changes in your um, neurophysiology, which is what Bruce Lipton and all of the mind-body pioneers have been saying um, for almost 100 years. Yeah. 
Well, I, I think it is becoming more acceptable for people to speak the truth in public formats. And I know that Charlie Rhodes and uh, Bill Moyers are going to have a more respectable template than many areas of the media for making these discussions. The truth is, is that the truth will never be challenged by quality research and science. And so as I look at these things coming around again and again and again, um, eventually there will become a societal admission that this is the truth, not just a theory. And I think that, you know, 35 years ago they did a study where they gave the same natural substance to kids at Harvard that had a different interview technique before they were given what they didn't know was just adrenaline. And in one half, the nurse, the screener, would start with the kid and say, you know, I've got some breath mints in my drawer if you'd like some, and, you know, I've got hair like yours, and I, I finally found someone who knows how to cut it. And in the other half, they'd make a comment, well, well, your hair is so nice. Who does it? I love your outfit and compliments. And the same chemical manifested itself as fear and worry and sadness and fatigue in those that were criticized almost 100%, and euphoria and feelings of well-being in those that were complimented. So on a direct aspect of neuroimmunologic response, we are in a instant relationship of how we choose to think as how we create our body chemistry with all of its very subtle nuances. But the aspects of cognitive therapy changing neurochemistry is, is delightful and certainly, uh, for me, a far better option than chemical incarceration of just chemically removing unacceptable levels of, of behavioral swings. Well, what I found so uh, remarkable was that all of the other doctors on the panel were focusing exclusively on actually creating a um, an electrical or some kind of intervention to try to achieve the effect that could be achieved through uh, cognitive, behavioral, spiritual means, if you will. Yeah. Um, it's it's just a different perspective, a different world view. How do you think we will ever bridge the two? Um, you know, I think it is a. It's been written for twenty six hundred years, and it's probably been true for at least six thousand that the majority of people, as the Neoplatonists say, follow their physical soul. They follow wealth, fame, power, and fortune. And only few people follow wisdom. It's a race consciousness change. It's a place of humbling ourselves to remove importance of how the outside world views us personally and our names and returning to a place where we review the outcome of our works, and that is what is of value for us. So I think, you know, those other people who weren't talking about cognitive therapy were wanting to get their name on some piece of equipment, get some degree of recognition for what they do. And I find this degree of... of insecurity, which is an arrogance of needing acknowledgement to be rampant, and it's something that I think our society and our educational system and our political system feed. You know, the other side of the coin, of course, is the humility that you describe as being one of the chief characteristics of Ralph, and how he is always learning, always going out, he's still, you know, into his 90s. Mid nineties, yeah, yeah. He starting next year, he'll be on his second half of the climb through his nineties. So he turns ninety five in November. Um, Ralph, like John Dash Steer, like um, Joe Boucher, some of the great pioneers, uh, exemplifies humility and therefore pursuit of wisdom and very little need to be recognized or famous 
and actually a recognition as he watched so many of his compadres um, suffer the consequences of IRS investigations and harassment by other entities, a need to actually try to be invisible. Because if someone became too well-known and too well-favored uh, in this field of medicine, then they, they got that bullseye target for them. And I think the humility served these great leaders tremendously to let them just stay within the realm of their relationship with their patients and their peers and not show up on the radar that far above the, the ground. So, yeah, I think humility and, as the Greeks called it, an acceptance of simple ignorance, that what there is to know is beyond any of our ability to fully capture and the most we can do is become as intelligent as we can with an understanding that that it is not going to answer all of life's questions. So Ralph and these other people constantly read, constantly study, are always looking for something new and therefore awake in the here and now. Mm. You know, one of the buzzwords today <clears throat> is integrative medicine. Um, and, uh, uh, you, in your practice, uh, I, I know personally, um, are constantly learning and constantly bringing in the latest um, research to inform your practice. Uh, tell me where um, you think naturopathic medicine is going. Is Is it... Uh, going to any kind of an integration with complementary medicine anytime soon? Uh, well, there is a level of integration that is ongoing and profound compared to where I entered the professional arena 30 years ago. However, um, this is one of the ongoing major discussions within our profession's leaders is as we learn a language of communication with conventional medicine is the learning of that language removing our awareness of past truths and so as the you know when I applied to become a naturopathic student there was only one college in America now there are nine all of them federally accredited them all of them conforming curriculum to higher levels of government standards and in the development of standards in medicine comes the loss of some of the esoteric and spiritually based practices. So I think that where naturopathic medicine is probably going is a sort of knockoff version of who we are with a much greater emphasis of the didactic science and a lessened appreciation for some of the more mysterious and, and uh, subtle forms of care. But at the same sense, um, you know, we, we exist within a government, a political system that regulates health care, and it's paramount for our doctors to be able to be legally integrated into their communities to practice. And so the efforts of the profession is to seek full national um, recognition. And that is an interesting aspect because Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Hawaii were pretty much primary care, full practice, full drug licenses. But as you go into a new state, you'll have the chiropractic association lobbying against your physical medicine rights. You'll have the pharmacy board lobbying against your rights to have prescriptions and so we're getting laws that are not full scope and that's where the double-edged sword of integrated medicine if you're integrated as a substandard versus a co-equal um, then that's almost a usury but it is very clear that acupuncture nutrition counseling hypnotherapy and other aspects of non-conventional medical practice have great outcome benefits to people undergoing standard medical care. Mm. The question is, will the overseeing head of the medical teams 
allow any degree of erosion of their first call or will they say you can only do what adds to and does not subtract from what our primary lead is so you know we're an interesting professional mix you've got people like myself who would find herbs on a short term and fasting as a long term is the main approach for most illness and disease and then you have other doctors that work for the cancer treatment centers of america and are going to for themselves consider chemotherapy and radiation and glutamine and melatonin and a few things and do it sort of cafeteria style and so i think you know we as a profession are at a pivotal pivotal place of will we retain our original roots and identity and foundations or will we morph into a complementary integrative component of a system as a lesser player hmm. and you know it, it gets it's hard to know which is the greater good uh, I think the greater good is staying with as much science and truth as you can and I think that there's the complex intelligence publish or perish people that think that any new science has value just because it's new and improved instead of always stepping back and making certain that everything has a reason, a logic, and a predictable outcome. Because so much of the research by special interests create outcome statistics that are not replicable. And, uh, and so what stays consistent? So I think our origins have the greatest value. I think the new model has the greatest ease of integration, but for me, do I want to pay a high premium to stand in the back of the bus, or do I want a co-equal process? You know, I think one of the critical things, I talked at a cancer symposium this last January, and I was the naturopath that wasn't from the specialized cancer naturopaths or the medical doctors that were talking. And I talked about I don't treat cancer, I treat people. And if cancer is part of their big picture, then they're going to choose how they integrate my work with their direction. And so I have for 30 years treated people with terminal illness. In some cases, I'm their only and their primary. In some cases, we've got a cooperative team, though that's less common. And in many cases, I'm just in the background providing support to help them tolerate the orthodox and conventional care. It's not my decision. People own their own mortality, and I think people own their own rights to choose medicine that's consistent with their belief, their understanding, and their values. And I think for some people, that's naturopathic medicine. Hmm. And yet you say people own their own mortality, and yet people have had to struggle for that right. Oh, yes. Um, I'm talking from a personal and spiritual basis. Uh, there's a lot of aspects that are co-opted by government regulations, you know. So, yeah, it, it's an interesting place to see how humanity and compassion and love um, often have to swim upstream to get any degree of holding in the way we live. Hmm. Well, getting back to Ralph for a moment, what do you think is his greatest legacy? I think his greatest legacy is the ocean of patients that he has benefited and that he was a sower of seeds for their future directions. So I think there's a lot of people, you know, Michael Murray, who wrote the introduction and who's written 20 books, um, is a nature path solely because he came into Ralph's life and Ralph helped him with something that that had not been responding. And so I think Ralph's greatest legacy is is the way he has lived his life and the service he's provided for others. Mm. Yeah, I, there was one very graphic um, patient example that you gave in the book about the dentist who worked upstairs. Yeah. One of the three stretches of the truth, only in that... My publisher didn't want me to tell the story the way I will tell in a second. 
um, because it what it was even more graphic. But he, but Ralph had just spent three weeks doing a daily visit with Wu Wu Ping in China to learn acupuncture in 1959, and he received the first English book, Wu Lu Ping's book on acupuncture in 56, and started praying to find a way to meet this man, and added phone calls to people, and arranged for a tour trip, and stayed behind, and found his way into the jail, and studied acupuncture for 12 hours a day for three weeks. And right when he came back to work, a dentist in his medical building came in, and he'd actually expelled about 17 inches of his intestines and brought it in a towel holding it in extreme pain and Ralph had tried everything for almost the entire day basically didn't see anybody as he tried witch hazel and menthol and packing and pressing and couldn't do anything and he'd remembered governing vessel 21 from Wu Wu Ping which is the crown of the head the crown chakra and they would body search him as he came out of the prison so that he wouldn't have any needles and Ralph didn't come back to America with any needles and didn't know where to order them yet so he didn't have any needles he might have had a blood draw needle but he took a big paper clip <laughs> and stretched it out and just holding it almost like a screwdriver just gouged at this point until it was at the point of mild bleeding and exhausted at the end of the day, and the dentist would not would not agree to go to the hospital, um, even though Ralph had a hospital where he assisted surgeries and could have could have gone with him. Um, went home, and Ralph comes back the next morning, and there's the dentist waiting for him, and he just thought, "Oh my God, here we go again." And the entire colon had pulled itself up during the night. Ralph believes from the governing vessel 21 and it never prolapsed again mm. and uh, he got the dentist to change his diet for about 15 years um, and then gradually he started returning to the things that left poor intestinal health poor digestion and didn't have a repeat of that but but he had about uh, 15 years of coming to a sense of eating whole fiber, good quality foods, and and taking better care of himself. Hmm. Well, we, we've only been able to really scratch the surface of the wealth of information and inspiration in this book, The Reluctant Healer. And um, I would like to ask you, Stephen, do you, do you have a website? What is your website? Uh... NWN Clinic, Northwest Naturopathic Clinic dot com is our website. Uh, and actually it's got my email and phone numbers. I'm I'm quite pedestrian in my life, not only the fact that I walk full box to work, but that I prefer to be called Stephen than any of the many titles. And I make myself quite available and I love sharing my passion for naturopathic medicine and fasting and and putting a hand down to lift people up, which is what my nonprofit does in the inner city. This Saturday, it's my turn to give the lecture on obesity and diabetes in the inner city populations. And so, um, you know, the reluctant healers at Square One, it's available on Amazon. And about 85% of the book is sitting in my computer and didn't come out in this version Ralph's Pearls and Wisdoms, our spiritual and metaphysical chapter, and a couple chapters on case studies um, got set aside so that people could just swim in the nice flowing story of this man coming through the heroic assault of natural medicine, finding himself through need and necessity, and thriving as he is a beacon of light and an inspiration for so many doctors in my profession. Indeed. And I, I really recommend The Reluctant Healer to anyone, not just medical professionals. It's a truly fascinating and inspiring book. So we've been speaking with Stephen Bailey about The Reluctant Healer. Stephen, thank you so much for being with us. You'll find The Reluctant Healer along with more great books and films on our website, ncreview.com. 
Well, our guest next week will be James Twyman, who is the moving spirit behind the Senior Cinema Initiative. You won't want to miss that. And now we're going to close today's show with our track of the week called Leap of Faith by Julie Rust. Where has my heart led me now? How did I arrive here? This place is so unfamiliar. How do I move on from here? Why am I so frightened? There's nothing here but silence. I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of now. I'm afraid I don't know what I'm doing. But I'll take the leap of faith. This place might be inspiration All that I know is the past And that I just let go of What have I got here to go on? I believe in love I believe in you I believe that you know what you're doing So I'll take the leap of faith daughters were three and five, a near-death experience left her ill for five years. Doctors were unable to help her, and this became an opportunity for Julie to heal herself. The most important aspect of this healing was songwriting and playing music. Although these years were extremely challenging, they brought a heightened wisdom and experience to Julie's life, which she shares with others through her music and daily Audible Insights recordings. Find out more about Julie on her website, julierust.net. Well, I think that's about it for today's show. I do hope you'll join us next week. And until then, I'm Miriam Knight for New Consciousness Review. 
Thank you for listening. Goodbye.